Hello viewers and welcome to the latest episode of the GI Huddle. I'm Tim Poole, editor of Gambling Insider, and I'm with Tim Miller, executive director of the Gambling Commission. Tim, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Um, wanted to start off with a quick question uh, about yourself. You've been, uh, you mentioned a, a panel you just spoke at, you've been at the Commission for, for seven years, I, I think it was. Can you talk us through kind of your, your role at the Commission and, and how that may have changed even over the years? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, as you say, I've been with the Commission for, for seven years as an executive director. Prior to that, had worked with a number of different regulators in, in different sectors. Um, my role at the moment is pretty broad, so I cover policy, research and statistics. But probably most importantly at the moment, I'm also the, the senior responsible officer for the Gambling Act Review implementation, which is, I mean, it's a massive programme of work, probably going to run over several years covering sort of 60 plus um, work streams. So, um, spend a lot of my time on that. <laughs> yeah, certainly an interesting time uh, to, to be in that role and, and a busy one. Um, I wanted to ask a, a sympathetic question because uh, at the Gambling Commission, um, how, how tough is it, how challenging is it being at the Commission given that you, you may well receive criticism from perhaps from the industry for being for doing too much and maybe from gambling critics who may call for the Gambling Commission is not doing enough? Yeah, so I think it can be tough. As I said before, I've worked in lots of different areas of regulation. And actually, I think this is intellectually one of the most challenging. Um, at the same time, though, it's potentially one of the most interesting and most rewarding that I've worked in. Yeah. But I think it is fair to say that we're operating in an area where the debate has been very polarised for a long period of time, um, often with some quite extreme views on different ends of the, the spectrum but similarly working with lots of people who are incredibly passionate about what they, they do. Mm -hmm. I think for us as a regulator, that does bring challenges that often, you know, an action we may take might please one side of a debate, but not the other. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, if you're upsetting everyone equally, that's a sign of success. Mm -hmm. I actually don't agree with, with that. Um, we're not looking to kind of upset people. We want to be able to demonstrate to people why we're making particular changes, why we're taking a particular approach making clear use of, of evidence so that even if people don't agree with what we're doing, they can at least understand why we're, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. I think that will be a really important part of the implementation of the white paper is showing people the evidence that we and government have relied upon. Yeah, I think the, your use of the word polarised is, is, uh, is extremely apt for, for gambling at the moment or really at any time. Um, you, you mentioned it in your speech as well, um, sort of um, mi misunderstandings, mis misinformation. Uh, that at the moment is, is, is quite topical given that I think that's a point you, you yourself have made uh, that the regulators dealing with a, with a lot of information, it, it might be tough to get that information across. And um, I suppose with the, the misinformation aspect, certain, certain sectors of the industry have their own kind of viewpoint and maybe try and get that viewpoint across when they're representing, I guess, so-called facts. Um, a, a, a long story short, my question is, has the Gambling Commission seen that there might be sort of misinformation from, from both ends of the spectrum, again, from perhaps from the industry, no, not naming any names in particular, but perhaps also from people campaigning for more maybe restrictions, but maybe that's not the right word, maybe sort of greater involvement? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone uh, is kind of blameless in, in this. I think, frankly, when you're dealing with some of the really complex topics that we are dealing with, all of us will occasionally get things wrong. And you know, that's fine. Where, where there are kind of errors, genuine mistakes, I think so long as people accept that and kind of uh, move on from that, that's absolutely fine. But I do agree that it's come from all different parts of the debate. A um, good example of that was we wrote to the select committee before we gave evidence to them a couple of weeks ago, setting out the areas where we felt people had misused official statistics in evidence sessions with them. And that covered voices from industry, campaigners, and indeed, we highlighted areas where MPs themselves had wrongly used statistics. Perhaps a slightly brave thing to do just before you go and sit in front of those MPs. But actually, the reaction that we had from the committee, I think, was really positive. Um, you know, a couple of MPs kind of said, yeah, actually, there are opportunities to be kind of more robust on this. And I think it demonstrated that we're, you know, we're there trying to be a kind of a robust voice around data, but also generally trying to help people get it right. Mm -hmm. um, a, a specific thing that you've, you've talked about recently, um, the GAM Protect uh, scheme, um, hopefully I'm, I'm saying, that, saying that correctly. Um, you, uh, you worked with kind of, uh, you mentioned working with the BGC on this. Um, can you just broadly tell us a little bit more about what it aims to do and, and the kind of things that we're involved in, in planning and, and perhaps creating it? 
Yeah, so what sits behind this is a recognition that uh, an operator looking at a customer will only at the moment have a view of that customer's kind of gambling behaviours with them. And what we know from our research is that people that are experiencing harm from gambling will gamble with multiple operators. I think on average they, they have around seven different accounts. So if you genuinely want to try and address harm, reduce harm and protect people, trying to get a clearer picture of their gambling across a range of operators is one of the ways of doing that. And the idea behind Gam Protect, which started off as a challenge we put to industry, was to find ways of being able to better share that information across operators, but in a way that consumers would have trust and confidence that the data wasn't being used kind of for different purposes, wasn't being misused. Um, so that then operators could identify those where the risk came from the, the broad kind of range of playing behaviours and provide appropriate support and, and step in appropriately. We worked really closely with the Information Commissioner, who's the, the expert regulator in data protection, so that we can give consumers that level of trust in how their data is being used. Um, industry are now at the stage of starting to roll that out, testing that, and we look forward to hearing the initial results from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in a market like the UK is with so competitive, I suppose that's, that's extra important because, as you say, um, maybe not even necessarily when it comes to gambling harm, the average player will probably have multiple accounts across, across big operators. Yeah, and I think what's really important with any of these interventions is that you know, we recognise there are absolutely a number of operators out there who want to take responsibility for this, want to step forward and show leadership in protecting people from harm, but are understandably concerned in a really competitive market that they will be at a competitive disadvantage compared to others. And actually, they might just drive those customers to their rivals. Mm -hmm. Our role as the regulator is where we clearly see things that are shown to work. So where industry perhaps have evaluated some of these interventions and it has a really positive effect for consumers, we can then swoop in and write that into our rules and kind of level the playing field and make sure that all operators keep pace with those that are seeking to show some leadership in this space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of sort of final topics from me. One, I wanted to talk about uh, the potential gambling ombudsman, which has obviously created a lot of, a lot of headlines and interest across the industry. Um, it might be through a misunderstanding of my own, but um, and this might, might be a direct question, but wouldn't a gambling ombudsman perhaps uh, clash with what the, what the Gambling Commission is doing? Is, would it be taking duties away from what is currently perhaps under the, the Commission's uh, list of things to do? So I think it'd actually be entirely complementary of what we do. Now, my, my background sort of before the, the, the Gambling Commission was with ombudsmen. So I, there's lots of things I don't know anything about. I know ombudsmen. And certainly my experience in those other sectors is that with clear agreements in place, the regulator and the ombudsman can work incredibly well together. The ombudsman can often be a really useful source of regulatory intelligence. So where they identify potential regulatory breaches, sharing that with, with the regulator. On the flip side, one of the challenges we found over the last few years is we get lots of consumers calling into our contact centre who have got complaints and looking for address and feel that as the regulator, we're the only place they can, they can turn. And whilst that again gives us some useful regulatory intelligence, it's incredibly frustrating for us and even more frustrating for the consumer when we say that we can't provide them with individual redress. Mm -hmm. So I think the establishment of an ombudsman fills that really important gap. Importantly, will allow us to be able to clearly signpost those people to uh, an ombudsman that can help them. And so I think overall strengthen the, the, the regulatory system. Again, if you look at other ombudsmen, as well as resolving individual complaints, one of the other real strengths they can bring is help an industry as a whole learn from what those complaints are saying and to drive up standards. And that's entirely complementary with, with what we try to do as a regulator. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I guess it sounds like your, your experience with Ombudsman, perhaps you, you would have uh, not necessarily pushed, but would have been in favour of, of something like this coming in. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, our, our advice that we, we published alongside the white paper was really clear that we supported the introduction of an ombudsman, we welcomed it. Whilst we said that we thought ideally it should be statutory, we recognise that the approach that's being taken of uh, challenging the industry to bring a scheme in um, does mean that you can bring that in much more quickly. And if it's done in, in an effective way, in a way that meets our expectations, those of government, those of the Ombudsman Association, then actually consumers will have access to that redress much more quickly than if we were waiting for legislation.
Uh, you've mentioned international cooperation with, with other regulators. Um, I'm just wondering, are there any in particular that, that you think uh, have, have perhaps done a particularly good job that the Commission could look up to? And, and what we've heard, neutrally speaking, is some praise for the, for the KSA in the Netherlands, for example, and, and in Ontario, Ontario uh, as well, just as, as examples that we've heard. Yeah, I mean, I think there are things we can learn from regulators all around the world. For, for a long time, uh, lots of regulators, particularly kind of newly established ones, were coming to us in the UK yeah. wanting to learn from us. And you can see in places like Ireland and Ontario kind of where the UK model has influenced that. Mm -hmm. But I think particularly if you look at North America, lots of newly established jurisdictions there with sports betting and online coming through. There's a lot that we want to, to learn. So we're looking to work increasingly closely with our sort of regulatory cousins in North America. We're in active discussions at the moment with around about 14 or more jurisdictions in North America to reach information sharing agreements. And some of those should be signed in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, in a couple of weeks time at the G2E conference, we'll be hosting uh, a round table with regulators from across North America looking at how we can cement that collaboration, particularly in areas like uh, illegal gambling. Mm, absolutely. Um, final question for me, might be the most difficult to answer. Uh, if I were to ask you for a kind of timeline on, uh, obviously there's consultations ongoing, but, but you've mentioned there are things that the, the commission and the industry can get to work on without consultations. If we're looking at a, perhaps a general timeline of, of when the most concrete implementations from the, the Gambling Act white paper were to actually uh, take place materially, I know it might be difficult without a crystal ball, but what kind of timeline could we perhaps be looking at? So I think, I mean, it started already. So, you know, within weeks of the white paper being launched, we'd completed the first two of our actions around uh, a, a, an information hub for operators on white labels and around vulnerability statements. So, you know, that action is already happening. Parts of the white paper are already, you know, here and, and done. In terms of the things that we're consulting on, um, you know, absolutely, we want to deliver at pace, but we want to do this properly. And I think in terms of those initial consultation topics, we can't give a set deadline because it is a genuine consultation. We want to see what the responses say, uh, learn from those. We've spoken in recent weeks about there's probably some areas where we might want to pilot some of these things to make sure that they work, to make sure there's no unintended consequences. Um, but I would expect as we go into next summer that many of the, the changes will already be starting to come, come through. Um, but I think in total, to deliver all of this, it will happen over the next couple of years. You know, there'll be things being delivered all the time, but to complete it all, to evaluate the impact, we're talking a few years. And that's probably indicative of the scale of reform that's involved in the white paper. Absolutely. And, and of course, even then, it's probably still an ongoing process in the, in, the, in the sense that something is implemented and the industry may react and there might be, might be need for something else to change and that kind of thing. Yeah, the task of regulation is never done. You know, we're, we're regulating a really fast changing, a, you know, rapidly evolving uh, environment and industry. And regulators need to adapt with that as, as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tim, thank you very much for, for your time and for your answers. And it's a pleasure to speak with you. Pleasure thank to you. meet you. Thank you.